about 10. And uh, because we are, we are incredibly blessed to have him here. Because I know, like for me, you know, I sat in the pew in the back of the church for years, going only every other Sunday, typically. And as I got more involved in my faith, I realized, you know, what can I really do? You know, I mean, let somebody else do it, or, or I'm not very good at it, or I can't do things. And Tim is one of those lay Catholics that had fallen away in a secular world and lived a secular life like a lot of us have. But he found his way out of it. Now, I'm not going to tell you his story, because he's going to explain it. But I can just tell you that his story will relate with probably everybody in this room at some point. And so as he speaks and uh, talks about his witness in his life, open your heart up to what he has to say and just ask, God, work through Tim for me and give me a message. That's it. Just, just one simple thing. So, uh, so Tim, we're just glad to have you here and uh, we're excited. All right, so uh, first of all, anytime I come to a conference like this, um, which I have over the last eight or nine years, all of the United States, Canada, usually it's parishes, I'm always thinking, what am I going to tell these guys? What am I going to tell these women? You know, I go to a women's conference. I'm like, these are the prayer warriors, right? It's like, I'm going to preach to the choir in such a big way, but I've been really shocked, really shocked, because I, after I do it, I find out so much of this information resonates with people. And more than anything, it's just going to remind you of what you already know. I get that big time. My main mission in life, though, frankly, is, is your kids and your grandkids. Because I already know I'm preaching to the choir to most of you, and I already know that if you're like most people I go all the United States, your kids and your grandkids, at least half of them aren't going to church, typically. Some of you are very blessed that's not the case. And uh, I was one of those. Uh, this is, of course, my mom and dad. I put that up there. Uh, my mom is here, for sure. I have no doubt about it. And my dad is in Ohio. I just left him back in Wisconsin, where I just got done with the parish mission. The greatest thing in life I get to do is travel and pick up my father over the last eight or nine years. And we get to travel to all these churches and meet people like yourself. I, I live here in Texas. I'm from Ohio. This is my wife and three children. I've gotten bigger than this now. I need to change pictures. But, uh, my wife's from Texas. That's how I got here. I grew up in Ohio. I went to church every single Sunday. And I'll tell you right now, I'm going to fire hose you with information because it's gonna, the bigger miracle about the other than the miracles I'm going to show you, is the fact that I'm going to get done in about an hour and ten minutes. Because this is a two-hour talk at, at best, for sure. So, um, But I've been married, uh, coming up on 19 years, got three children. And uh, I can tell you this, my wife wanted nothing to do with the Catholic Church. It wasn't a Kimberly Hahn thing. My wife and I met in a bar in Dallas, Texas. And, uh, and we went from the bar scene to the Bible scene. In fact, we got married in Lake Tahoe. <clears throat> I came down here in 1999, and I went to, to the cathedral here in, in Texas, Dallas, down in Dallas, and I said, I want to get married. And the deacon said, uh, you're going to have to sign a piece of paper to raise your kid's Catholic. And I said, I, I, I don't know if I can do that, like as though I'm a moral person, right? And he said, why? I said, well, I don't even go to church <clears throat> that often. And he says, why are you here? And I'm, saying, I, I'm like, naively, I'm, I'm, well, I'm Catholic. He's like, what do you mean you're Catholic? You were born Catholic, raised Catholic? Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean you're, you're Catholic. Okay. My wife said, no problem. We're just looking for a beautiful place. And we got married outside the church. My parents hated this. They're living in Ohio. And uh, I found this picture years after my mom died at my dad's house. And there's my mother. It's August 15th. It's the Feast of the Assumption. And I have to tell you, my feast days were Ohio State, Michigan football. I went to Ohio State University. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm leaving here. If I have to leave a little bit early, I, 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 I coach my son's football. We're 4-0 with the Buckeyes. So we, I play over in Keller, Texas. But, but uh, in truth, I look back at this, it's so providential. I know for a fact that if you're here right now, it's because a mother or grandmother has been beating up rosary beads for you somewhere in your ancestry. I get that. There was my mother in Lake Tahoe. We left for our honeymoon. We got married in Lake Tahoe, but my wife and I went to Hawaii. And my mom only went there, and she drug my dad there. He didn't want to go there. And I look back at this, and there she is on the Feast of the Assumption in front of the Blessed Mother, praying for everybody she ever met. When she died, the prayer ladies told me, hey, Tim. Your mother was voted most likely to be a saint. Just to give you a picture of my mom. That's my mom. One of the things she was praying about is that we started going to church. You heard of Fellowship Church in Grapevine, anybody? First time I started going to church again, I called my mom. I said, Mom, I'm going to church. 
She said, is it mass? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> even, though I went to, even though I grew up in a Catholic church, I didn't go to Catholic school. And I didn't pay attention much, you know, like most people. Went off to Ohio State, partied my tail off. Eventually got heavily involved in drinking and drugs down here in Dallas. I was at all the rave parties, all night parties, did that. I was right in the mix of that stuff. And we got invited to this big church, and I thought it was cool. My wife had a theater background, so she, did, she wasn't opposed to this. I wasn't against it. Um, and uh, my mom said, well, I need to introduce you to somebody. So she introduced me to this guy, Marcus Grodi. You guys have heard of the journey home. Maybe you haven't. He's, it's been on for 20 years. It's still on. She taped every, remember the VCR tapes, right? She taped every show, every single show. She sent it to me. I was in Euless, Texas. And I was going to a fellowship church, and I, I got my men's Bible study. I didn't know something like this existed. Maybe it didn't back then. And I honestly was uh, first Bible study ever in this Bible church. And she introduced me to this guy, and I heard all these people who were Protestant who became Catholic. Any of you read the books, right? I'd never heard of this in college. I could care less. But at this time, in 99, when I was going to fellowship church, I wanted to make sure Christianity was true, so I went on a factual, evidential you know, quest for truth. And I started hearing all these people who converted to the Catholic Church, but I said, you know what, I'm a, I'm a football guy, uh, not a Bible guy, but I know there's always two sides to every story. And my mom just asked me one thing. She said, all I want you to know is what you're giving up. To me, I'm not giving up anything because I don't think I ever embraced it. This is the first Bible study I was ever in. But I said, okay, mom, I'll do that. But I'm going to put smart people around me. So this is me way back when. In fact, the guy, you see a little baby? He's taller than me. He can hold Father Mitch Pacman out as my son. <clears throat> that was in Euless, Texas at my house. I had leaders from Denton Bible Church there with Father Pacman debating. I also had Tim Staples at my house. I used to record them, and I would feed them. And I started listening to debates. Long, long story short, because that's not the topic of my talk today. I came back to the Catholic Church in the early 2000s. I have to tell you, I learned my Catholic faith by listening to debates. Anybody who says debates aren't important, I have to tell you, they were massively important to my life. And I listened and I still do. I know more about the daggone Protestant Catholic faith than I know about football now, for sure. And uh, I came back and my wife said, I'm not interested. I, you know, we went from the bar scene, literally, the hardcore bar scene, if I can tell you that, to the Bible scene. And we had to focus on the family values. My wife was loving it. She didn't want anything to do with the Catholic Church. She didn't understand it, relate to it. And then it goes back to this. The topic of this talk, or the, the title of this talk should probably be called The Power of a Mother's Prayer. There's no question in my mind. Because my mom sent me another tape. Now I'm going to give you the cliff note version in about 45 minutes, rapid fire. My goal is so I can get into your parish. That's my friend and my biggest goal in life. So I can reach way beyond you. I can reach the people who only come to Mass once in a while. That's what I'm really after here. But uh, when my mom sent me this tape, I had two questions. Now, just by a show of hands, how many of you know who Padre Pio is? Okay. See, when I go to parishes, you'll be shocked. 90% of them do not. And I thought everybody did now. I didn't. I didn't grow up in a Catholic school. I never heard of somebody having a stigmata. I never heard of Eucharistic miracles. I'm like, so my mom sent me this tape, and I witnessed this lady who you're going to see in about five minutes have a stigmata. And I, had, I was in Euless, Texas. I'll never forget. I had two questions. One was, is it real? Secondly, if it is real, what does it mean? Is that really from God? It took me 10 years before I found this book because it wasn't launched until 2007. The truth of the matter is, I lost the tape my mom gave me. I used to go to people's houses, and it didn't matter if you're Buddhist, it didn't matter if you're atheist, Catholic, I could care less. I would stick it in your VCR, and I would say, what do you think? Everybody would say, amazing, is it real? I have no idea if it's real. It took me 10 years. Somebody called me out of the blue and said, you lo I left a tape at my house, some guy from Arlington, Texas, he doesn't even go to church. I got there, and it was my mom's tape. I got on the internet, and I found this book. Hope everyone you get that book. I don't write it, write it. I don't make a red cent if you buy it. And I read all the Scott Hahn, the Steve Ray, and the Apologetics books, and I love those books, but nothing, nothing, nothing began to impact my life like this book. As soon as I read it, I started going to daily mass at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Keller, Texas in 2009. And uh, in fact, I was fortunate because this person that was in this video right here, that guy, if you look at the screen, how many of you remember Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes? That's who he is in Australia. Famous, voted richest 200 people in Australia. He hated the Catholic Church, and I want to stress, he hated the Catholic Church. And he was rich, he had his own show, and he was an investigative journalist. And I'm gonna give you the cliff note version, but I had him, I hosted him at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in 2009. And the Keller Citizen called me out of the blue and did a big article. 
And that's what launched this whole thing. I never meant to start anything. I never had a plan to start anything. I just wanted everybody to hear this story. Here it is. I told you who he is. He's like the Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes. And one of the first people that I want you to hear about is the person that really impacted. The thing that caught my attention. The thing that I personally use for evangelization for the kids who are lukewarm and indifferent. Because kids love the supernatural. They just love it. So if I can get their attention, I can lead them back to the original deposit of faith. I want you to hear from Mike Willisie about this lady real quick, and we'll continue. Get us started. Who are you going to introduce us to first? Well, I think at first, this search for signs of God was less about faith and more about fraud. On two occasions, I investigated claims where miracles were said to be taking place, and both proved to be phony. Then about 12 months ago, I visited Bolivia. There, I was struck by a lack of ego, cult, or money-making. And I was impressed by a woman who seemed to be very special. In Bolivia, in the very center of the South American continent, lives a woman named Katia Rivas. She is one of the chosen. She says she hears and sees Jesus and the Virgin Mary. Now, if Katia is telling the truth, then firstly, why her? Cuando el Señor me habló, yo sí le pregunté al Señor, ¿por qué a mí? I did ask the Lord, why me? And the Lord replied, if there were in the world a more needy person, a poor and more wretched person than you, I would have chosen that person. When we heard claims of supernatural phenomena taking place in Kaki's house, we took our cameras to investigate. Almost immediately, a statue of the Virgin Mary began to weep oil. But if we thought this was astonishing, on our second visit, we were shocked into suspending belief. This is a simple framed print of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It hangs in Kaki's hallway. But on March 25, 1999, something truly inexplicable occurred. We witnessed and filmed a gathering of thousands of colored crystals on the image, bright and exquisite in their artistic form. So there is more to Cartier than her claims of heavenly messages. However, her past gives few clues of the happenings of today. Her childhood was relatively ordinary, and in adulthood, she was sometimes troubled, married three times, and not devoted to God. But in 1993, she found herself turning to prayer. Cartier says it was the Virgin Mary who first spoke to her. Were you satisfied your sanity was okay? Yes, was okay. I was scared, and I thought I was sick. I needed the help of a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Katia asked herself why and for what purpose. The answer, she says, came from Jesus himself. I asked, what do you want from me, my Lord? He said, be calm. What I need is to convey messages to humanity through you. This is why my mother has been preparing you. Katia says she then started receiving messages from Jesus and writing them down. She writes in a beautiful but simple style about complex issues concerning life, spirituality, and theology. Nine books in all. And sometimes in languages unknown to Katia, like Polish, Greek, and Latin. All this from a woman who never finished high school. Her bishop took the exceptional step of approving her writings, giving them the imprimatur of the church. Katia was also assigned a spiritual director by Lorenzo Cecilo. As we continue to visit Katia at her home, the artistic glitter of the picture of Mary continued to grow and change. On the third night, we noticed 
part of the image illuminated in the dark. We then bathe the image in a strong television light. The same area lit up into a brilliant phosphorus green. To us, a mystery. To Jakartia, it was simple. A gift from Jesus and a message. This was the womb of Mary, where he became man. Well, already we are left with so many questions. But what I find remarkable is that this woman, Katya, doesn't even have a high school education, and she was able to write in so many different languages, including Greek. The writing is beyond their understanding. Katya writes non-stop, line after line, page after page, and it's theologically sound. It's intelligent, it's elegant, it's poetic, and it's all these languages. Specifically, I said, how can you write in Greek when you don't even know the characters? And she said, quite simply, Jesus, shows me these characters. And they have been authenticated, you said in the piece, by the church. Yes, her bishop has given her the imprimatur for her writings. And now there's my mom on the Feast of the Assumption in 99. I started putting these pieces together and I started going, it's a mother thing, I get that, right? Now this is what really caught my attention, I want to show you this real quick, just some pieces of it. Um, and when I saw this, I mentioned what happened, but here's the story. This man, Mike Willis, he was drug into this. I ain't got time to tell you the whole story, but drug into it. He said, I don't believe in miracles, I don't believe in the supernatural. And he, he, after seven years of his, his neighbor, who's an attorney researching this, they, he went over to Bolivia from Australia. The Fox Network paid him. And they said, this lady's having a stigmata every Friday. You know, Padre Pio died in 1968. So for the skeptic, the doubting Thomas like me, I don't know anybody that knows Padre Pio. So, I mean, how do I know it's, it's, it's real? You see what I'm saying? Well, they said she was having a stigmata every single Friday. They went over there, and, and it wasn't predicted she would, but it was like, well, we'll go over on Holy Week in 1999. You know anything about mystics in the church? They seem to have these things on very special days, right? And so the night before, she started getting, oh, she seemed anxious, and so on and so forth, and you can see this on my website. But I want to show you what happened when they went over there for the first time, and this is going to set this story up rather perfectly. We began our investigation of stigmata in Bolivia at Easter. We believe that Cartier's stigmata could happen on Good Friday, the day of Christ's crucifixion. <coughs> if this was to happen, we would be ready to film it and take samples of blood for laboratory testing. But as we began filming, Katya says she received another message for us from Jesus. That maybe this is not the moment or time to take the samples you are looking for. There would be no stigmata. We had come all the way to Bolivia, it seems, for nothing. And we were disappointed. But the messages continue. Learn to trust in me more. This is not the right time. According to this message, the stigmata would happen in Jesus' time, not ours. Our patients, we were told, would be rewarded. Ready? Ready? Great. Katia, are you ready? The following day came an incredible prophecy. As we were setting up for an interview with Katia, she interrupted to say she had received a new message from Jesus. In reference to Mike, he will see more marvelous things through me. Not only would there be a full stigmata, but the exact date it would occur was stated in the message. The day after the day of Corvus Christi. No maybes, no conditions. This was our first specific prophecy. So would you expect stigmata after Corvus Christi? The next day. Cartier's credibility was now on the line. On June the 4th, we had an appointment with God. Our science would test Cartier's faith. I want you to notice 
something that I only noticed three months ago. I've given this presentation, this talk, 400 times. And I've seen that video more than you can imagine. And I just picked up on this, and every time I pick up something new. They, this was the 60 Minutes camera crew. Most of these people were not believers, understand this. They went over there not knowing at all that she would have what you're about to see in a minute, the stigmata. <clears throat> and at the end of the show, as you know, she said, hey, it's not gonna happen. And she gave this prophetic message, and it said, come back the day after the feast of Corpus Christi. Now, isn't that a weird thing to say? If you're gonna have somebody at your house, would you say, come to my house the day after Friday? <clears throat> they go, why don't you just say Saturday? <laughs> they didn't pick up what I'm about to tell you for two years, the primary researchers. They didn't know feast days. They just said, all right, what's the day of, let's feast of Corpus Christi. All right, that means June 4th, all right, 1999, they come back. Well, notice what they honed in on. Look, look what, how they edited the film. Now, these are people, they have no idea what's going to happen. And they come in, and you're probably wondering, so what? We'll see in a minute. We'll see in a minute. I just picked up on it. It is amazing. So I, I want to show you a small clip of when they went back to it. By the way, the prediction said, come back two months from now. It said, it'll start on Friday. It'll, it'll last at 12 noon. Start at 12 noon. It'll last for three hours. And it said the very next day, <clears throat> the wounds will be completely healed. Jesus is said to have started to carry the cross at midday and died at 3 p.m. So those were the hours we were watching for. It's 12 noon, and Katia is feeling the pain that she believes is the beginning of the stigmata. I check Katia for any visible signs, but there is nothing. Given the scars from previous stigmata, there's nothing fresh. As the minutes pass, her pain appears to intensify. Is the stigmata really about to show itself? Cartier's spiritual advisor, Father Renzo Cesolo, is by Cartier's side. He notices that her forehead has begun to bleed from tiny wounds, which would be consistent with the crown of thorns. She feels it's burning. Bless you, Cartier. Excuse me. It's 12.15. The first mark of the stigmata on the hand is now appearing. A tiny cross has appeared on Cartier's hand. This is the only thing we have observed. It's the other thing we have observed. We have seen the signs of the stigmata. We have seen the signs of the stigmata. Wounds now appear on Cartier's feet. They start to bleed. Father Renzo intensifies his praying. As carefully as I can, I take the samples we need for our blood tests. I'm stay away from the woman. She's clearly coming through very dramatically and very quickly now. Just one more guy. We've been with Katia for more than an hour and her wounds have continued to deepen. She is bruised and grazed below her left eye. Are these the wounds of Christ? Just relax your hand. And you'll see that they came back, the wounds would be completely healed. Uh, and so for people who say she cut herself or she did it by psychosomatic, you say, well, how do they, how do they heal themselves, right? I love what they told Padre Pio. They, maybe you know the story, but of course, he bled a pint of blood every day for 50 years. He bled a cup of blood out of his side every single day. Somebody accused him. They said the reason that he bled the stigmata is because he used to stare at the crucifix so much that by the power of the brain, and I don't know if you know the story, but I love his response. He said, go out to a pasture and stare at a bull and see if you're going horns. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who says that baloney has no evidence to back it up. It's true throughout the church, inside and outside the church. People say all kind of phony stuff. They have no evidence to back it up. They say, oh, I'm a big evidence person. I'm a doubting Thomas. I want to see if you believe that's who I am. And this was so important to me. That's why I wanted to meet her, and I did. That's why I wanted to meet them, and I did. 
and got to know them and to know that this was real. Now, once I found out it was real, more important than that was, what does it mean? It goes to what I'm going to show you right now. It took me 10 years to find this out. Uh, that the prophecy cuts had come back the day after the Feast of Corpus Christi. Okay, why? Well, obviously, if this is from God, he's high, Jesus is highlighting a feast day. It's Latin for the body of Christ, but there's not literally one of, maybe one of the 500 Catholics that I meet. And I'm not throwing stones. I do none of this, okay? But there's not one of 500 Catholics that I meet, including people who work at the church, that have any clue as to how this feast day was ever started. We don't know why we do what we do. That's one of the biggest problems we have in the church. I think it's a perennial problem. And it started because I'm going to show you because a priest was doing mass in Italy. And I don't mean Lanciano. We'll talk about that in a minute. And while he was doing mass, he didn't believe in his heart that, that the central core teaching of the church, which we all know what that is. And the host started to bleed onto his hands and onto his altar cloth. If you go to Orvieto, Italy, and I'll show you this in a minute, you can actually see the same blood-stained altar cloth. That is actually what instigated this feast day. So in 99, if this is from God, obviously there was something being highlighted. There's a takeaway. There's a message I'm supposed to get, which is doubt. The priest didn't really believe. But it didn't happen on the feast of uh, the uh, Corpus Christi. It happened the day after. And normally the day after is not the feast of the Sacred Heart, but in 1999 it was. So two months before that, they honed in on this statue. And yet, they have no idea she's going to have a stigmata, and they definitely have no clue it's the Feast of uh, the Sacred Heart. Even the researchers didn't know this, and she had what you saw, a full stigmata. The first time in human history that anything like this has been prophesied on and recorded on film and happened that we're aware of on the Feast of the Sacred Heart. So what is the Feast of the Sacred Heart? A lot can be said. Let me keep it simple. Jesus pulled his heart out of his chest, look at the screen, and he said, it's not like a Valentine's heart. It's got thorns around it. It's suffering. It looks like a suffering heart to me. It's showing a lot of love, but it's showing a lot of pain. And as he told St. Margaret Mary, he said, my greatest wound was indifferentism. Boy, can I relate to that. I used to go to Ohio State, Michigan tailgate parties for four days straight. Maybe you can relate. I would come home to my, my, my small church in Ohio because I was in the Air National Guard. And so I'd come home once a month to stay with my parents. And I would go to church. And of course, I received communion. <clears throat> And knowing what I know now and knowing what you know, that's, that's, that's crazy. That's insane. And I realized that I was causing tremendous pain to Jesus. In fact, at the end of the, at the, end of the show, I wish I would have understood this message. I saw this, but I didn't understand it. I wasn't even going back to Catholic Church. I was researching this. I would studied all the apologetic stuff. I was convinced the Catholic Church was true, but in my heart, I was confused because when I went to St. Michael, and I could pick any church, I'm not picking one out of the blue, but when I, I went to St. Michael in Bedford, Texas for the first time, and I went back to church, it was like I remember. People came late and left early. At Fellowship Church, they had 50 Bible studies and 100 home groups going on. They met you early. They, had, they wanted to pay your mortgage if you couldn't pay it. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, and I thought, how can this be true? How can the Catholic Church, everything that Scott Hahn and Steve Ray and David Curry and all these people that I heard, how can this be true? If this is true, why isn't the church on fire? I didn't figure all this out until this message for me. At the end of the show, he asked Catalina. He said, what do you want people to get from this? I'm like, give it to me. What is it? She said two things. Now remember, he just witnessed this lady have a stigma. He didn't know about feast days in the Catholic Church. And she, look at her message. She said, I want them to remember that we have a live Christ in the Holy Eucharist. What? What does that have to do with the stigmata? Everything, if you know about the Feast of Corpus Christi and the Feast of Sacred Heart. And then she said, please don't forget Jesus' suffering for all of us. This leads so perfectly into mystical phenomenon number three. When you hear this language, I am the living bread who came down from heaven. He's actually reading quotes from messages, this lady says come directly from Jesus, and the church says nothing contradicts church teaching. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, they shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life. That was almost one year before the Last Supper. But even then, Jesus knew that doubts about the reality of the sacramental gift of his body and blood would persist in the centuries to come. 
And so it would be that Jesus would intervene miraculously to endorse the truth of this sacrament. Here in Lanciano in Italy, in the 8th century, a priest who had doubts found that at the moment of consecration, the bread turned to flesh and the wine turned to blood. He immediately stopped the Mass, and that Mass never ended. That flesh and blood exists here today and has been on display for 1,200 years. It has not been artificially preserved. It has not deteriorated. For that alone, science has no answer. In 1970, Italian professor Eduardo Linoli, an expert in pathology, carried out the official examination of the relics. He found that it was human flesh and blood. La carne, come un frammento di carne, e venne fuori che era mio cardio. Quello è sicuramente mio cardio, è una struttura tipica del frutto. Asked his personal reaction. Per qualche mese mi sembrava di camminare 30 centimetri più alto, più stretto, poi scesi giù. In giving the church's imprimatur to Lenoli's report, Archbishop Enzio D'Antonio said that science had given a certain thorough response to the authenticity of the Eucharistic miracle of Lanciano. We are reminded again, 500 years later, of the truth of his living presence with another Eucharistic miracle. And every year, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, the people of Orvieto in Italy celebrate this miracle in procession. In the 13th century, another priest had doubts as he was consecrating the host. He began to bleed over his hands and onto the altar cloth. The people marched to the nearby town of Orvieto where the current Pope was in residence, displaying the blood-stained cloth. The Pope instituted the great feast of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Christ. And that same blood-stained linen cloth is solemnly paraded to this day. Even now, at the start of the new millennium, another case is being examined. In South America in 1996, a priest found an abandoned communion host in his church after the Mass. He placed the host in water. Within days, blood-like substance emerged and grew in quantity over some weeks. In 1999, the mission was given by the Archdiocese for the substance to be scientifically examined. So far, it has been found to contain human DNA and to have evidence of flesh and blood. The sample was examined by noted forensic pathologist Dr. Robert Lawrence of the United States. Mixed in it are these white cells, these little dots that you see. If this material had been placed directly into water after it was taken off a body, I would expect these cells to be dissolved. If you put cells in water under such conditions, they would be expected to dissolve. How long? A few uh, minutes to an hour or two at the most. So uh, they were active, living white cells at the time they were collected. This South American sample is the subject of further scientific analysis. So Jesus always knew this gift would be a test of faith for many. Notice he said they were active, living white cells at the time they were collected. The truth is they sat in water for over three years. And as you saw, they asked the forensic pathologist, and I have all the video of this, you can see the raw footage. He said, what would happen, uh, doctor, if you took living cells and you put them in water? Now, if you never heard his response, he said, oh, they'd be gone within minutes to an hour. And the researchers, Mike Willis and these guys are going, wow. Now, he doesn't know. So they took this, 
these samples and they send them to independent labs. It's kind of like forensic CSI. They have no idea the source of the sample. They certainly don't know it's from a piece of wheat bread. I'm going to give you the very cliff note version of the studies. They came back and they said, this is human blood. They said, we've got DNA, but we can't get a profile. Now, what I didn't tell you about today, and you can read about in the book or on another presentation, is there's a statue that's been crying and bleeding for about 20 years. Almost nothing outside of Shroud and Our Lady of Guadalupe has been put to the scientific ringer more than this statue because of modern science. MRIs, CAT scans. But when they did the blood test and they sent it to forensic labs of the statue, the same guys, they came back and they said, this is human blood. They said, but we can't get a profile. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I understand that if you have all the elements of blood necessary, you can track criminals. And they had all the elements in the blood, but they couldn't extract the genetic profile. And so it would be like if I had your finger, and I, Mike Willis, he was skeptical of this now, because he said, something stinks. I'm not a scientist, but as an investigative journalist, why can't we get a profile? Well, then they got to this, this supposed miracle of the Eucharist. Blind studies came back, and they said, hey, we've got blood, it's human, but we can't get a profile. And he said, huh, that sounds like the statue, right? He goes on, he said, there's both flesh and blood in the sample. Zoom to be, as you can read, cardiologist, pathologist, and a biochemist, most of his career, he was the chief medical examiner of Rockland County, New York. If you had to pick just one word to describe his legacy, it's heart. Legendary for his studies on the heart. They wouldn't tell him the source of the sample. And looking through a microscope, you could see him doing this. He looks at this, pulls this book out, and he says, I can tell you exactly what this is. Look what he says. He says, this is heart muscle tissue from the myocardium, the left ventricle wall. I get that I'm going rapid fire. But in the video you just saw, they were talking about Lanciano, Italy. 1,200 you know, 12 years ago, in, in 700 AD. And when they did the test on that, the doctor said it was myocardial heart tissue. Well, these are guys are the one that interviewed the doctor who did Lanciano, and you just saw them. So they're going, another common denominator. They're saying two separate miracles, 1,200 years apart, and they're saying it's myocardial heart tissue from the left ventricle wall. Again, I'm not a doctor, but they said, what's the significance of the left ventricle wall? And as you can see from the screen, he said, it's the muscle that gives the heart its beat and the body its life. Now again, I'm preaching to the choir. All of you know that the church says the Eucharist is the source and summit of life. But these scientists didn't know this is from the same consecrated piece of bread. And he said, yeah, this is the muscle that gives the heart its beat and the body its life. St. John Paul the Great said it the best. He said, the Eucharist is the heart of the church. Ah, isn't that interesting he used the word heart? The Eucharist, today I'll play football and tell my, tell my kids every single time, hey, I don't care if you lose, I want you to win. Make no mistake about it, we're undefeated. But, but just give it your whole heart. My 11-year-old kid doesn't go, you, you want me to take my heart out of my chest? They know exactly what I mean. <clears throat> Please look at the screen. Uh, St. John Paul the Great said it. He said, where Eucharistic life flourishes, there the life of the church will blossom. Is the church blossoming right now? Yes? Come with me and travel, okay? I think we all know the statistics. From the time that somebody gets confirmed until 30, 85% put going to church, they're in your family as well. Let's call a spade a spade, right? The church is certainly, vocations are up in places. My point is, it's not, I mean, there should be a bunch of 25-year-old kids in here, shouldn't there, right? 30-year-old kids. So it's not, my question is, why? That's the question I had back in 1999. I mean, if this is true, how come they're lined up over there at Fellowship Church? I know you think it's all about entertainment, but it's not all bad. They got the word of God. They're preaching Jesus. I think they should be Catholic. We'll talk about that. But uh, they're doing some things right. I think it goes to the rest of my story right here. Look, look at the screen. He's going to be studying this. He says, the heart muscle's inflamed. Does that look like an inflamed heart? She had that miracle of the Eucharist or the stigmata on the feast of the sacred heart to pinpoint, to highlight something very important. She, her message was, she said what? She said, I want you to know we have a live Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And please don't forget Jesus' suffering for all of us. And now here we go. The same people who studied her are studying this miracle of the Eucharist. And they're saying the heart muscles inflamed. There's been recent injury like those I see in cases where somebody's been beaten severely around the chest. Look at the quote. The person that had this heart must have been very wounded. They were tortured. If you only understood this man's credentials as it relates uh, to the heart. It's amazing, he's saying, yeah, whoever this was, man, they were, they were wounded. He thinks it's a homicide. He goes on to say, they bring it back to him, look at this, this should drop, this should floor you, because it sat water for three years. There's no way that it could be alive. 
Catalina Rivas said, I want you to remember we have a live Christ in the Holy Eucharist. He comes back in the 2000s and he says, how is it that while I was studying this sample, it was moving and beating? How did you take heart from a dead man and bring it to me alive? He thinks that they took a like, piece of heart. How is this possible? He did not from a piece of consecrated host that sat in water for three years. Remember Catalina's message that she said, I want you to remember we have a live Christ in the Holy Eucharist. And please don't forget Jesus suffering for all of us. This is not a Eucharistic miracle presentation. As any of, most of you know, the Vatican has over 100 documented cases. I want to share a couple other ones. This is Mexico, 2006. This is an actual picture. When they studied it and they sent it to the lab, look what they found. They said it's heart muscle tissue from the myocardium. They said it's from a heart that suffered. Let's go to 2008 in Poland. Myocardial heart tissue from a heart that suffered. The sample analyzed was not from a dead person. The person was alive. And again in 2013, heart muscle that more signs of distress. I hope you get the picture. It's a suffering heart. Let's go back to Argentina to, to get the message behind the miracles. They told him it's from a piece of wheat bread. And as you can see, this is an exact quote from him. He said, how or why a communion host could change its character and become living human flesh and blood. That's his quote. He said, science has no answer. Nor does the church. It's called a mystery. But why it happens, I think we can tap into that. Going way back in history. Jesus told this to Catalina Rivas. He said, I allow myself to bleed in many hosts before your eyes so that you will be certain that miracles keep on occurring before your unbelief. You see, we have all these miracles in the church, but 95% of Catholics in the pews like me have no clue about them. And you've got people saying miracles aren't important. I beg your pardon. If they're from God, he didn't do it just because he's bored. They may not be a part of the original positive faith, but we live in a culture and a generation that says, I'll believe it when I... You're not unique. Everybody knows that. So let's talk about this. There's only one book that even talks about it. I'm preaching to the choir here. So let's go down that path real quick to get to the deeper meaning here. As you know, Jesus says, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the bread which I shall give to the life of the world is my flesh. If you know your scriptures, which I never did, when he said this, they started murmuring amongst themselves. And of course, you know, they love the Old Testament. You shouldn't drink blood. You shouldn't be a cannibal. So they're like, what is this? He says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. At that point, thousands of people left him. Why were they following Jesus to begin with? Miracles. Miracles. 100%. He said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. And the last I checked, when Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I can touch him, he didn't kick him to the curb, did he? He said, touch them so that you might believe. He said, he eats my flesh and drinks my blood as eternal life. He claimed to be God. He said, I'll raise him up on the last day. Now I want to fast forward. So I went to Fellowship Church. And uh, they always talk about, I'm not here to bash a non-denominational church. I think they have their place and God is using them. And I hope to dump all of those people into the Catholic Church over the next 20 to 30 years. I think that will be the renewal of the church. Uh, but it's better than being in the bar, I promise you that. But let me fast forward let me get to John 15. In last at the Fellowship Church, they said it's all about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Tim. It's not about religion. It's about going straight to God. You don't need anybody between you and God. You know the pitch. Uh, of the people who go to non-denominational churches, 40 or 50 percent of them were baptized Catholics. And uh, so I, I look at this, and Jesus says, "I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing." <coughs> look what he says. He says, "If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch, withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown in the fire, and burn." Sounds like hell, right? So here's the hundred million dollar question. How do you abide in Jesus? Well, as I tell my non-denominational evangelical friends that invited me to Fellowship Church many years ago, there's only one place in the New Testament where Jesus lays it out, because you know they love the Bible. So I say you should take note of the scripture, John 6, 5, 6. It's the only place in the New Testament where he uses these words. And he says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am him. So you say, yeah, exactly, Tim, absolutely, but nice, nah, for sure. Yeah, well, why is it, though? Their hearts are that the Eucharist is bleeding. Why is it that 85% of the kids are leaving the church from the time they're confirmed until 30? If this is where it's at, all I gotta do is go to Mass, everything's, everything's good. It's not the case. We know that's not the case. Let's dig into that. I'm gonna lead into Padre Pio, my favorite. I knew nothing about him. Some of you know way more than, than I know, but since, since I found out about him, I've read about five or six books on him. 
I am just so enthralled. And I think he should actually, there should be a big thing on like Anderson Cooper or like, uh, you know, or Fox Hannity on this guy. It's just amazing, right? He said, as you can see, he said that men only appreciated the value of the Holy Mass. He didn't say they would need traffic officers every weekend. He said every day. Now, for those of you that may not know the full story of Padre Pio, I just want to take a couple things. As I mentioned, he bled upon his blood every day for 50 years. But these were real injuries, not scratches, right? I mean, they say you could see light from one side of his hand to the other. Um, his feet pierced. A lady comes up to him and says, Father Pio, how can you stand there so long? His mass when he started out was three hours. And you complain about an extra five minute homily. <laughs> he said, uh, how can you stand there so long with your feet bleeding? They said, when he could do mass, if you read all the books, they said, it was excruciating because right during the consecration, it was as though he was dying. And sometimes you can see blood dripping down. If you look at his hands, the only time he took his gloves off because he, he tried to hide it was mass. And she said, how can you stand there so long with your feet bleeding? I never would have understood what the, the response was 15 years ago, even 10 years ago. He said, daughter, I am not standing. I'm hanging. What? Well, Jesus told Catalina the same thing the church teaches. It better be the same thing the church teaches. He said, I'm the priest. Oh, I thought all priests had to be holy. Nope. Wish they were. Not relevant. He said, I'm the priest. I'm just picking up that priest. I'm using him. Just like he's using you. Just like he's using me. I don't know if you heard of it. Catalina Rebus said, why me? Mike Willis, he said, why you, Catalina? Why is he picking you? She said, he told me. He said, if there was anybody less unworthy, I would have chosen him. <laughs> Married and divorced three times. A party animal she was. Major conversion in 1993. He said, I'm the priest, which is why I'm offended when people don't celebrate Mass purely. Now we'll get into the crux of the matter here. Let's talk about that. She said, I want them to remember we have a live Christ at the Holy Eucharist. And she said, please don't forget Jesus' suffering. You think, when you think of suffering, if you're like me, I'm like, I watched the Mel Gibson movie, it's when they were beating him, right? I'm a paraphrase. And Jesus says, if you think of that, you're missing the boat. He said, that's not my greatest suffering. My greatest suffering was in the garden the night before because I took on all of the guilt. Now, I've been guilty many times in my life. And I know how it feels, right? So have you. Imagine taking on everybody's guilt all at once. Past, present, future. Right? He knew that Tim Francis would be trying to recover from smoking crack cocaine and going into the bathroom at, at St. Michael's in Bedford, Texas because I didn't, I didn't know where else to go. This, this is the kind of world I got into. And I, I got to tell you, if any of you have kids or grandkids that are like struggling with addiction, I grew up with the best parents in the world. But I was ended up down in the hood in Dallas and other places with people with gold teeth and nine millimeters, heavily addicted, starting with drinking, then it went to cocaine, then it went to crack. I'm not proud of you, but that's the reality. I say that because it's, if any of you have kids or grandkids, it's not your fault. It's the culture. So he says, this heart of mine suffers. And then he says, here's why. I'm like, okay, no time. He says, sacrilege, lukewarmness, and indifference. Hopefully, you understand that's exactly what he told St. Mark of Mary. St. Maximilian Colby said the greatest sin of the 20th century is indifferentism. If that is the greatest sin of the 20th century, what the heck is the 21st century? So Jesus said this to Catalina. He says, when I was getting beaten, here's some of what I was thinking. I'll never forget reading this. He said, when those filthy and repugnant hands dealt me blows and slaps, I saw how often I would be struck and slapped by so many souls who without purifying themselves of their sins, without quitting their house with a good confession, would receive me in their hearts. Let me take you down the path. The Bible says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. This makes sense. As to why St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest teachers, arguably in the church. I mean, there's only like 34 doctors in the church in 2,000 years. They're not infallible when they speak, but you probably listen. St. Thomas Aquinas said there's two prayers you should pray. If you go to St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, I know they have it in their book. You can follow along. St. Thomas Aquinas' prayers. He says two prayers you should pray. One before Mass and one right after communion. Probably all of you kind of do this. 
I know I didn't, and I guarantee you 90% of the people in the pews aren't. I'm not judging, I'm calling a spade a spade. St. Thomas Aquinas said, after you receive communion, do this. He says, and by the way, as you know, the Bible says anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Look what St. Thomas Aquinas said. I pray that this holy communion, may, this is what we're supposed to pray, after I receive Mass. I was, if I went to Mass, it was like, okay, fourth quarter, communion, let's get out of here. I pray that this holy communion may not bring me condemnation and punishment. What? He says, may it cancel my faults, destroy concupiscence. As you know, concupiscence is your natural tendency to do the things you know you're not supposed to do, like argue with your wife on the way over to a conference. And carnal passion, increase charity, patience, humility, obedience, and all the virtues. As you know, the church says, hopefully you know, the church says, I'm only picking one because this is something real clear to, 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 to point out. It's a mortal sin to miss Mass on Sundays or a holy day of obligation. 70% of all registered Catholics, I didn't say former Catholics, all four registered Catholics stay away from Mass. Of the 30% that go, only about 15% go every single weekend. About 95% uh, miss a holy day of obligation. Does that mean it's a mortal sin? I probably don't think so, but that's up to God to judge. The reason I don't think so is because there's three conditions to be mortal. Thank goodness. <laughs> One is bad. That's grave matter. And if that is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ being represented, it's not a representation of the Last Supper primarily. Hopefully you know that. It's a representation of the same sacrifice. If that's true, then if I put sleeping football, God, or party, or vacation ahead of going to Mass, I put something else before God. So if that's the case, it's grave matter, right? I mean, there could be a graver matter than the sacrifice of Jesus being presented on the altar as a sacrificial lamb. The second one is full knowledge. Probably all of you know this, but if there's two of you that slept in there, snap in there, somebody drug you here, and you didn't know that blowing off a holy death obligation because you're on vacation could be a mortal sin, tag your head. <laughs> and the third is full consent of the will. You've got to know it's wrong. There's a lot of things we could say. Of course, the church says anyone conscious of the grave sin, you need to go to a priest. I can hear my good friends at Fellowship Church saying, and Ed Young, as I heard him say, you don't need anybody in between you. You go right to God. Catholics say that, right? I confess my sins to God, not to men. As we know, the scriptures say, as Jesus went back up to heaven, he breathed on them. He said, the sins you've forgiven, they are forgiven. The sins you've retained, they are retained. Padre Pio, they used to take you two weeks to get a confession. He could bilocate, he could be in two places at once. He could levitate off the ground to show the risen power of Christ. His, one of his greatest gifts was he could read your heart, just like St. Catherine of Siena. He knew every sin you ever did. Do you know how many people he kicked out of confession? A lot. Who sins you have forgiven, they are forgiven. Who sins you have retained, they are retained. God would come up there and pulled up in a limousine, not because he wanted to get confession, because he was rich and he wanted to see this great miracle Italian priest that could heal people and have the stigmata. Padre Pio called him out and he said, you're a heathen, you're cheating on your wife, get out of my face. Lady came up to a confession. She, she came from Paris to Italy. She was there. Every time she would go up there, he'd close the window. <laughs> The relatives finally said, it's been two weeks, Father. She came all the way from, from Paris. She wants to confess. He said, bring her in. He brought her in. He said, you're on your way to hell. <laughs> what are you talking about? What do you mean, what am I talking about? You've been going to, you've been going to uh, Mass for 15 years with, with, with your family just to show your stuff. And the reality is you haven't been confession for 10 years. you got mortal sin all over you and receiving communion. I was just at a parish mission in Pennsylvania. Two people came up to me afterwards, and one was from Argentina, a young couple, stood out to me, young couple, one from Argentina, one from Mexico. They said, we have to tell you, they're very humble. They said, we have to tell you, we're shocked about America. I said, what is it? They said, everybody goes to communion. In our countries, they don't do that. My dad said, when he grew up, some of you may remember those days, my dad's 83. He said, when we grew up, everybody didn't go to communion. They took it very, very, very serious. Jesus says, confession is, is a medicine, not a punishment. I thought if you were going to confession, it's because like, Maybe you beat somebody up in a bar and almost killed him. <laughs> we found out my mom was voted most likely to be a saint. I've told you that, right? Well, we found out later from a, you know, when we thought, look back, when mom was going to confession, we thought, if mom's going to confession, then we're going to hell. <laughs> what would she confess? You know, you probably have somebody like that. She knew what St. John Paul the Great, he went to confession every week knew. She knew that it was a medicine. Look at the screen, vices are cured. Let's just say you go to Mass. It's like 10, you're preaching to the choir. Dude, I go to Mass every week. I'm a part of the, I'm a part of the men's group. I'm part of the Padre Pio group. I do this, I do that. And every weekend at Mass, you have a place you sit with your spouse or by yourself. 
And one weekend, you get to mass and somebody's in your seat. <laughs> and you didn't even hear, you weren't even participating in the first 10 minutes of the mass, were you? It's like you're disrupted. I got to sit somewhere else. You lost your peace. It's not some mortal sin, right? You're trying to get out of church and some young kid's sitting in front of you text messaging and you blow up. You lost your patience. Patience is a virtue. Last I checked, the opposite of virtue is a vice. Doesn't mean it's like you're a bad person. We all have it. Temptations, people say. Let's talk men. I'm just wired that way. Listen, there's people in this room. Let's call a spade a spade. That at this very moment, you are dealing with addiction, pornography. You know you are. I almost guarantee it. It's pervasive. It's hard to get away from. And you say, man, it's just tough. I'm just like women. I'm like, oh, big shocker. Me too. <laughs> I have a friend that lives over in Fort Worth. He looks like a biker, like a, like a, like a hell's angel, because he used to seriously be in a, a hardcore biker deal. I mean, heroin, drugs. His wife was a strong Catholic, praying for him, praying for him. Now he goes to daily mass. I love talking to him. I love him, because he's got so much raw wisdom. But he went to a priest and he, he, he couldn't quit watching news and TV. He said, I feel like I'm addicted to it. The priest said, get rid of your TV. I'm not kidding. Seven years ago, he went home with a shotgun and shot his TV. <laughs> because when you've been to hell, and you, some of you know that, when you've been to the dark pit, which I certainly have in the drug world and the party world, you don't got time for all this baloney. Somebody tells you to do something, do it. It's black and white. It's black and white. Lady walked into Father Pio, told you took you, you had to get a ticket. He hated the notoriety. Don't, don't misinterpret this. He hated it. But people wanted to hear. They wanted their heart pierced. And so it would take you two weeks to get a confession. She walks in, she says, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been a month since my last confession. I'm like, is it Lent? You're back already? <laughs> month, right? I mean, come on. Man, it took me 20 years. Look what he said. He said, how the blood from Father Pio has five pillars of holiness. Five. I like formulas. You know, I want to bench press 500 pounds back in the day. I never did, but I wanted to. I want the formula. What do I got to eat? How many reps do I got to do? All right? So he's a saint. He says, I have five pillars of holiness. One of those is weekly confession. You don't have to go. It's not a church, you know, deal where you have to go to every single week. But here's what he said. He said, confession to the soul's bad. You must go at least once a week. Hold on a second. 70% of all registered Catholics are blown off mass. What percentage of those 70% are you think are going to confession? It's called a goose egg. There's always an exception to the rule. You know who's going to confession? It's the prayer ladies at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. All eight of them. <laughs> now, the truth is, at St. Elizabeth, they have a lot of people going to confession, but not compared to how many people are going to communion. Give me a break. I mean, you have 15,000 people going to communion, and you have 20 people going to confession. Uh, either everybody's on their way to Satan or we've lost the value and the understanding of confession. Maybe you know this, but here's my visual. The Mass, any of the sacraments, but those two, the sacrament of reconciliation. <laughs> Jesus Christ picks up the priest like a water hose. And if our hearts are right, by the way, if you go to confession all the time, great. If you eat, whether you do or not, um, I want to highly recommend that you Google or have your kids Google the uh, How to Make a Good Confession by the Fathers of Mercy. How to Make a Good Confession by the Fathers of Mercy. And before you go to confession time, I want to challenge you to have a full examination of conscience. The priest gets picked up. We go through and he sprays grace using the priest on us. People say it's just for mortal sin. Now, last I checked, the catechism in St. Faustina's diary said it's for healing of the heart. Healing of the heart. Jesus' heart says, I want to put my heart on your heart. My father retired when he was 56, 57. I grew him from Wright Patterson Air Force Base. He, he worked civil service as an airplane mechanic. I don't think he made more than $30,000 a year, raised six kids, and my mom stayed home. I love my dad. Back then, I hated it because... He was the most non-materialistic person. We never got to eat out, ever. We ate roasted potatoes every night of the week. Looking back, he has the same wardrobe today in 83 that he had when I was little. And I love that now, by the way. I love that. 
Now I can travel with my dad, but I want to give you the picture of my dad. My dad was the hardcore, we're doing this, there's black and white, I don't want to hear any excuses, don't make any excuses, I don't want to hear it. He's like that today, don't give me any excuses. Yeah, my mom was the softie, okay? So that was, our, that was our deal. My dad retired, he had everything paid off. My mom did not have to get a job, but she went and got a job because she didn't want to stay home with dad. <laughs> they were married 39 years, she loved him from a distance is the way I look at it. It was true love. Sacrificial love, no question. When my dad retired, he had to wait 10 years for my mom to retire from her secretarial job so he could travel. We didn't go up, we didn't grow up going to Clearwater Beach and fancy stuff like Walt Disney World. We went to local fishing. That's what I grew up doing, fishing. And I love it, but we didn't get to do what I call the fancy stuff. So my dad wanted to spend money. For my dad to spend money, he got no idea. Because he grew up 11 kids on a farm. He understood the value of hard work like nobody's business, and he understands the value of dollars. So he saved his money, paid everything off, and he's ready to go to Florida. He rented a place for three months. I'll never forget, I was in Texas. My, everybody, my brothers, I'm one of five boys and a girl there in Ohio. And uh, I remember talking to my mom, she said, well, we're off. She was kind of concerned. She said, I'll only go with you on two conditions over time she got bold. She said, I'll go with you on two conditions. One is, you have to get a cell phone. For my dad to get a cell phone is like amazing. And she said, two is, we have to be by a Catholic church. Because over time, mom got more and more and more involved. Maybe your wife's like that, and you know that. And he heard a prayer, ladies. So my dad got a phone. While he was driving from Ohio down to Florida, I got a phone call from my brother Paul. Of course, you never forget these things. He said, Tim, he said, you need to get to Georgia it, immediately. He said, uh, while they were driving, mom had a massive heart attack. He said, she's in a coma. They don't think she's going to make it through the night. I never saw my dad cry except when his mother died ever in my life when i got to georgia she was sitting my dad was over here not only was he crying he was shocked to this day he's still stunned because in his his words he says this was not supposed to happen this was supposed to happen to me not to her that in his mind that's how it was going down and in his mind he's still almost stunned well they said she's not going to make it to the night and after about a day or so dad flew her back to date he was on his way after 10 years to go into florida he flew her back to date Kettering Medical Hospital, and I slept in that hospital what seemed like six years, I think it was two weeks. I've never journaled anything in my life. I'm not a journaling kind of guy. Something made me journal. I started, I was going psychotic watching my mom on, on, on those machines. We had good news, I'll spare the details. We thought that we had a solution for her. My wife flew back to Texas to get our stuff, and I thought I'm gonna take care of mom. And I remember sitting in the hospital room and they called us into the room, maybe you've experienced that. And they said, her vitals are going down. Remember my, grab dad, my, my dad grabbed my hand, and we don't do that. It's just how it is. My dad loves me to death, and we just ain't like that. I hug my kids to death, but my dad grew up in a generation where it's awkward to shake hands almost. And my dad grabbed my hand, and I watched my sister screech out a deal, and watched my mom take her last breath, and she died on January 19th. When I got to her house, my dad's house, I spent two weeks with him before I came back to Texas. And I went and dug up. My mom, um, I dragged up my baptismal certificate, and as a baby, I was, I was baptized January 19th. I thought about that with the sacraments, the initiation to the end. I thought there's something significant to there. That's why I say it should be called the power of the mother's prayer. I wasn't just bad. Many of you were bad. I almost died multiple times in very, very bad situations. It's not time to go into. I have a question. It wasn't until I heard I saw that CD at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, where they had the kiosk with Lighthouse Catholic CDs. I just read that book, Reason to Believe. And I read it, and I heard making sense out of suffering. I sent it to my brother, Mike. I said, I want you to hear this. We didn't go to Catholic school. I said, what do you think? Mike said, my older brother said, I think people don't know this. I said, man, I know. It took me six years before I ever found out the true meaning of my mom's suffering or death. My mom was ready to die, but we were ready. The hardest part, as you can imagine, was flying back here to Texas, leaving my dad in that lonely home. And I thought, why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, I thought my dad's the greatest man in the world. Yeah, he was angry and all that stuff, but you know, he just took care of business. And he did everything he was supposed to do. He sacrificed a job he didn't like. And there he is, my mom dies, on the daggone road trip, massive heart attack. You know how many people came up to us at the funeral in that little small town, out of the blue, said, here, your mom gave me a letter. I was going to have an abortion. There's no way she could have known. And we would say, I know. I know. That was mom. So I remember hearing this CD and it said, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's suffering. Hundred million dollar question, of course, is what's lacking in Christ's suffering? Everybody says, nothing. Well, obviously Paul said there is something. And it's, of course, our participation. 
Padre Pio, and I thought about my mom. I thought about this lady suffering. I thought about Padre Pio. I thought about you with your kids, your grandkids. Maybe it's a divorce, maybe it's an abortion. This was a revolutionary thought to me. That Padre Pio said, when Jesus wants me to know he loves me, he makes me suffer. Now, he doesn't make me force it upon him. Padre Pio said, yes. But he said, he makes me suffer the wounds, the thorns, the anguish of his passion. He says, you sure you want this, Padre? I want it. Why? Because I want to help souls from going to hell. You do. Go preach. I don't want to preach. I want to suffer. Now, you grew up, some of you grew up and offered up. I did not. I want to suffer. I want to suffer. My whole life, we've been told to stay away from, you know, we're supposed to get away from suffering. These three gifts, when we talk about suffering, that I want to bring home to you today. The Jesus Christ, the passion. Here we're going to come up on Advent. Then we're going to come up on Lent. Everybody's going to watch, or a lot of people are going to watch the Bell Gibson movie. They're going to say, look what he did. We sang songs about it. Look what he did. Here's my question. How do I accept what he did? If I go to Gateway Church or Fellowship Church, and I'm not bashing those churches that I'm just saying out as, as it is, they're going to tell me how I accept that gift, and you know what they're going to say. They're going to say, close your eyes and say the sinner's prayer. The problem I have is that Jesus told us exactly what to do, as you know, before he went out and killed. He instituted the mass. He said, if sins you have forgiven, they are forgiven. That's not what he said. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Right? And of course you probably know that the word remembrance does not mean to remember. Hopefully you know that. I'm not Google or talk to Chris West and they'll tell you what it means. Alright? It, it means to bring from the past to the present. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. I'll never forget. Uh, we were going to the mega church and the Catholic church. And uh, my kids would say, are we going to the fun church or the boring church? <laughs> and they still don't like masks. Why would they? Now, it's exceptional if your kids do. I don't expect them to. But when I understood this, that it, that it was the sacrificial mass, I tell my kids now, I don't want to go to mass. Why are we going to mass? I go every day. Some of the guys I see from St. Mark's, I see at, St. at, at daily mass. I tell my kids, the reason we're going to mass today is the same reason we mass yesterday. To receive, okay, Dad, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> See the body of blood of Christ. I said, I, you may not understand this today. I don't expect you to. But hopefully before I die, but probably after I die, you're going to understand the power of the sacrifice of the mass. I remember hearing Ed Young say, Jesus said 20,000 people. And I'm sitting in this church to keep my marriage intact because I was going to both the mega church and the Catholic church. My wife at the time didn't want to even do it. She's Catholic now. She leaves the Catholic homeschool. But she said, uh, he stood up and he goes, Jesus says, we were doing the monthly grape juice and wine and bread dip crackers. And he said, Jesus said, this represents my body. He said that. My wife said, don't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> I literally almost stood up and said, he did not. <laughs> that wouldn't be cool, I understand, but I can't control myself in situations like that. My wife doesn't like when we get together with our non-Catholic friends because I can't keep my mouth shut. I challenge them all the time. They never want to talk about Jesus anymore to me. Uh, too bad. Then is his mother. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Thirty. No, I don't. <laughs> Fifteen minutes. Thank you. I want to thank, by the way, Ralph and uh, Kyle and Rick and all the men. I don't want to say this as like a humble pie deal. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. It's stupid for me to be here. All the stuff I did. So many of you guys have lived responsible lives. And anytime I go to a conference, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm preaching to the choir, but I guess God wants to use who he does. Jesus says there cannot be anything more intimately united to each other than the Eucharist and my mother. He said, it's not the mother feed with her own blood and form with her body and child anymore. So if we believe that's the sacred heart of Jesus, the first organ that appears in the mother's womb of the baby is what? It's a heart. So who helped form that heart? Padre Pio said, in all of the free time you have, he used to sit in confessional booth for 10 to 18 hours a day. Wow. <laughs> You're going to hear this if you already have. That how could you be Catholic with what's going on? And I just want to remind you of what you already know to give you strength to encourage you when you do hear this. 
Or maybe there's somebody who snuck in here that's wondering that yourself. And I want you to hear this again and again and again. The Catholic Church holiness has nothing to do with the people, necessarily. The saints, yes. But the sacrifice of the Holy Mass, of course, is why we go. And I, I'm so happy we have men like this that we need to stand up and be bold and, and understand that if the priest is doing things they shouldn't do, which most don't, most are holy. But if they don't, it has no relevance at all to not go to church. If you don't like the priest's personality, or you don't like their homily, and you quit going to church, shame on you. If you switch churches, shame on you. It should be about the holy sacrifice of the Mass. If we want to make it about the personality of the pastor, then go to Fellowship Church. Or Gateway Church. It is about the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And it, most of you all know that I get that. But he said, in all of your free time, he said, pray the rosary. He said, look what he said. The rosary is the weapon against the evils of the world. People, I have non-Catholics come to this talk at parishes. Hopefully, if we do a, a talk at your parish, I want you to bring them all. And he says, all grace is given by God past the Blessed Mother. And I said, I can prove that. Jesus came to the Blessed Mother. And they always go, huh? Those of you who pray the rosary, my mom used to beat that rosary beads up. I had a rosary. I, I, uh, I lost it. I lose everything. I'm so ashamed. Left it in a car somewhere. But um, Mary said, one Hail Mary said with your heart has more power than ten rosaries repeated by those who repeat their prayers in a routine fashion. It's very easy to do. This is one of the things that I've, I've started doing. And uh, Jesus says, when you pray the rosary for someone, every bead is a drop of blood. And those drops fall, those drops fall on the person for whom it's offered. So if you do pray the rosary, if you don't get God to start praying, most of you do. I got a new devotion for you. After every Hail Mary, think of somebody new on that bead. And, and I always kind of close my eyes and I, I pinch it and I'm like, drop that blood on you never get distracted when you do that. Jesus said, spread this devotion because my mother promised that if just one member of the family prays it every day, she'll save the family. And this promise is signed and sealed by the Divine Trinity. I always say it's probably, unfortunately, when you have cancer or something very severe or you die that sends your grandkids or kids back to church. God uses that. Jesus told Catalina, if one of your loved ones is far from us, pray to him. Give, look, what, look what he said. Give him to my mother, and she will bring him in her arms to me. There's my mom. I'm getting married outside the church. I started going to fellowship church, but I'm struggling with addiction like nobody's business. She's there honoring I'm getting married outside the church because that's my mom. My dad wanted nothing to do with it, but he came. And she's on, on the Blessed Mother, in front of the Blessed Mother, asking Mary to pray for anybody she ever met in her life, including you. She sent me this tape. I'm in Euless, Texas. I have two questions. Is it real? And what does it mean? And please understand I'm giving you the quick note first. I lost it. Ten years later, I find this book. I, that's it. I start going to Daily Mass. Call my brothers in Ohio, Mike, Paul, Phil. Everything Mom says is true. <laughs> It's me and the prayer ladies at St. Elizabeth Ann Seat. And one of the reasons is because if you look at the screen, at the, at the back of that book, I got a hold of this, this book. It's in that book. It's a small book, but it's called The Holy Mass. By the way, by a show of hands, how many of you have read Live the Holy Mass by Catalina Rivas? How many of you have read it? If nothing else, I promise you, whatever level of involvement you are in your faith, if you'll go back and if you get on the internet, you can read it for free. If you'll just read that book, Mass will take on a more richer, deeper meaning. It'll never be the same. I promise you that. I hear that over and over and over again. All of these messages, if you look at the screen, approved by the church, given the imprimatur, the bishop wrote a page and a half, and he said, I plead with you. Her archbishop said, I plead with you. These are not pious writings by a Dr. Scott Hahn, if you will. He said, these are words from God. This is what her archbishop said. He said, I plead for you to read them and print them. In 2009, I took that initiative, and I started reading them with the prayer people. And, and prayer ladies, the same as with Anne Seaton. And everything happened. This whole thing happened. Everything took on. But the message to me, I got no audible message. The message to me was, Tim, you've been selling everything for other people in the secular world. And he said, uh, uh, you're going you're gonna to be working for my mother and help bring people together. And ironically enough, not six months later, I had that man who was on that tape in Ohio on September 8th, the Blessed Mother's birthday. <gasps> 
And uh, I don't have time to show you this, but he, uh, we're going to make a major motion picture. I'm waiting for him. He's writing another book, not for money. He's very, very rich. It's a 17 year project, him and the guy who wrote Reason to Believe. And I'm, I'm in talks with them, and, and, and I'm waiting for them to give me the rights so that we can make a major motion picture, not a religious film, a God's Not Dead for Catholics, telling this story in a, in a powerful way so that people from all over the world want to see it. But when they come out of it, they're Googling confession, adoration, Padre Pio, and all these things. I'll tell you this quick story. My, my daughter, I live in Justin, Texas right now. My daughter came into my room three years ago. I've been doing this since 2009, this talk. She came into my room, and I have a box of stuff. She likes to dig through pictures. She pulled this out. She said, is this you and mom? Said, yeah, it is. It's laminated. And I said, you know who put that in the newspaper? I said, my mother, your grandmother. She never met her, right? So I tell her stories. Too. And I turned it over. Now it's laminated. Now what are the odds that my mom called a secular newspaper in 1999 Say, I'm putting my son's wedding picture, even though he's getting married outside the church in there. But I want to make sure, secular newspaper, that on the back of it, it says Catholics come home. <laughs> <laughs> I about fell over. <laughs> I about fell over. So now when my daughter brings me stuff, I stop everything. I'm like, what's my message? <laughs> Talk to me, mom. <laughs> my mom is here right now, which she is, I'm sure. She wrote me letters all the time. I don't know if I ever read them. Maybe you can relate. I kind of skimmed them. I'd be getting ready to go to a rave party and my mom sent another letter. When she died, I went, I went to my dad's house and he had, uh, she had started putting letters on, on a, a word processor or whatever because she couldn't write it as good anymore. And I, so she had a floppy disk, you remember the floppy disk? And I went there and I got that and I said, letter, I saw all these letters. So any letter I could get that I found, I put together. And in my house, I have a, I have a book called Letters to Mom. But in 1999, I read this in 2009. We started this because of a book called Reason to Believe. My wife said, let's call it You Shall Believe. Good enough? All I wanted her to do was tell the story. And then I read this letter from my mom in 1999. She said, if you can't find a Catholic church that has adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, go to weekday mass. Spend some time afterwards with your readings, your prayers, your silence. Don't receive the Eucharist unless you really believe it's the body of Christ unless you go to confession. That's my entire message summed up <laughs> from my mom. And I never heard of adoration. I never started until I went to St. Elizabeth Ann Seat and I read a book that Jesus gave to Catalina called In Adoration. I dare you to read that book. In Adoration. And uh, it's on my website, You Shall Believe, you get it for free. And then I heard about this. Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Calcutta was asked, what would it take to end abortion in America? She didn't even flinch. She said, if every parish in the United States offered three hours of Eucharistic adoration each day, abortion would end. And then she said, if people spent an hour a week in adoration, abortion would end. I was just telling Kyle, I was in the church in St. In, in St. Thomas at Moore in Denver, the, the largest church in the diocese. There. And I went to a That Man Is You uh, meeting on a Wednesday morning. This is a weekly meeting, not a conference, a weekly meeting at that church on at 6.30. There was 150 men there. I said, how'd this happen? He said, John Paul II was here in 92. He said he challenged our church to launch perpetual adoration. He said everything took off. I've never, ever, ever seen a church that had perpetual adoration that wasn't on fire. I want to end with this. Two things. One is, people always ask me how I get my kids back in church. Come on, it's up to the Holy Spirit. The last I checked, God helps those who help themselves. People say, I don't want to offend people. I don't want to tell people about my faith. I want to live. Listen to me. I think if you live right, people will just naturally follow you. Yes? yes. I don't agree with that. I, 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 uh, I, I told a guy who told me that, and I said, Mike, how many people have come up to you in the last 20 years and said, I like how you live. Can you tell me about your Catholic faith and sponsor me? How many have done that to you? It happens once in a while, not that often. Cut the baloney. That's a bunch of baloney. If the early church did that, you wouldn't be here. They went out. Could you imagine Peter telling Paul, I'd like to go out, but I don't want to offend people? <laughs> I don't mean you have to hold up a sign and say, you know, repent or you're going to hell. I don't think that's a good methodology. But now we have so many resources. So many resources. Now, what I really want from this conference, more than anything, is... For you to write a number down in a minute and to call me, even if you think you're not the person, just call me.
and allow us to talk to see how we can get into your parish to start something. Not to end something, to start something. Because we can light a fire that you can take and you can reach the 70 or 80 percent. And then you have all these great things like forms and all these resources. The trough, I call it. People say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. But you can get them to the water with the use of resources in the Holy Spirit to where they want to take a drink. I've proven it over and over and over. I've got about 10,000 feedback forms. But for those of you who won't call me, and a lot of you won't, but know why. Uh, if you want your kids and grandkids, what do I got, Kyle? Two minutes? Three minutes? Three minutes. Three. Cut me off. Go to youshallbelieve.com and do it yourself. Don't give any, anybody anything that you haven't done yourself, please. Go to youshallbelieve.com and go to watch an amazing video. What you're going to see on there is my mom's video that she sent me in 1999. You make a 20-minute appointment with the people you love, especially your kid and young people. Just make a 20-minute appointment. Don't tell them it's about religion. They already know that about you. <laughs> and say, hey, I need 20 minutes of your time. I need you to be on a, on a computer, not a smartphone, on a computer. At that 20 minutes and only at that 20 minutes, you get them on youshallbelieve.com, watch amazing video. They're going to watch it because they spread, They just took 20 minutes. Tell them to turn their phones off. They can do that. All right? Don't text it to them. They just got 9,000 texts yesterday. They're not going to read it. <laughs> After they watch that video, you hand them if they're at your house or you send them. If they're in Argentina, Brazil, or United States, I don't care. You send them that book. Again, I didn't make it. I don't make the sense if you buy it. That's not my pitch here. My whole goal in life is that millions and millions of people read that book because they want to read that book. And after they watch that video, the chances of them reading that book go about 5,000% and send them that DVD. That's a, pre that's a presentation I was filmed at in 2012 at St. Maximilian Colby in, uh, in Ohio. And, uh, and then after you do that, <clears throat> if they're not local and they don't go to a parish, I would highly suggest that you uh, um, leave them alone. <laughs> you know, and ask your wife to leave them alone as well. Um, and just pray for them. Right? Our week of adoration. Confession at least once a month. A Father's of Mercy. How to make a good confession. Get to Mass early. Don't talk when the candle's lit. It's not social hour. Even for the Knights of Columbus, it's not social hour. That's outside of the deal. Come early. Offer all of your sufferings, everything, at, at the sacrament of the Holy Mass. Uh, and write that number down. Call me, and uh, I want to have a conversation about how we can further this. Thanks for your time.